Good morning. Hey, good morning, everybody. It's another beautiful Sunday morning in Colorado Springs, Colorado. And today we're going to be looking at Luke, the 14th chapter. Luke, the 14th chapter, verses 25 through 35. This is where Jesus talks about the cost of being a disciple. Now, this is very, very interesting because we are living in the era of easy believism. So in other words, we'll kind of adjust the requirements of the scripture according to cultural norms or in cor according to simplicity, where very seldom do we talk about when you give your life to Christ, you are giving your own life away. I had a man call me one time and he said he was suicidal and was gonna kill himself that day. And I said, well, tell me a little bit about your life. And he told me about it. And I said, yeah, if I was living a life like that, I'd kill myself too. And then I said, why don't you consider killing yourself and then living for Christ? And he said, I don't know what you're talking about. And I went ahead and explained it to him that when you give your life to Christ, you give yourself away. You die to yourself. And you have to die really daily. And you reorganize re, um, uh, all your relationships. So Christ and Christ alone is the priority relationship. But all your other relationships that you valued up until now, and, uh, many of which have been discouraging for you, uh, those relationships have to be subservient to the relationship with Christ. So if the family's doing a big event on a Sunday morning, you say, hey, that sounds like loads of fun, but I just can't go on Sunday morning. I always start my week off with worship with the brothers, or brothers and sisters. Or you establish a priority system in your life so that you are not just a follower of Christ, but a disciple of Christ. It's very, very different. Now, here's what the scriptures say. It says a large crowd was following Jesus. He turned around and he said to them, if you want to be my disciple, you must, by comparison, hate everyone else. So in other words, you reprioritize your relationships. Your father, your mother, your wife, your children, your brothers, your sisters, yes, even your own life. Otherwise, you cannot be my disciple. And if you do not carry your own cross and follow me, you cannot be my disciple. Okay, the cross is an instrument of death. That was the popular method of, of, um, uh, of execution during Jesus' day. The Romans used the cross often to murder people or to uh, execute people. But always the person that was going to be executed on the cross was going to have to carry their own cross beforehand. Here Jesus is saying, you've got to die on your own cross. You, you're going to have to give up your own life to live life for me. And you're going to have to carry that cross. And so here he is emphasizing the point for every one of us that when we give our life to Christ, it's a very, very serious series of decisions. And, and now that we're in this era of easy believism, see, it used to be 150 years ago, they would talk in church about giving your life to Christ and the cost of discipleship and things like that. And then after the service, they would tell people, go somewhere where you can be alone and tarry until you meet the Lord. Sometimes people would go for days to meet the Lord, sometimes hours. It was never instantaneous like we talk about now. But during the 20th century, we started getting instant hamburgers, instant clean clothes, instant transportation, instant so many things, coffee, all right? And the church adopted that for instant conversion. And so we instituted the altar call. That's only about 100 years old. And with the altar call, we said, if you'll come forward and repeat this prayer after me, then you'll be saved. The Bible just simply does not describe it with that simplicity. <clears throat> now, I'm not putting it down. All of us need to be praying lordship prayers. And it's during those lordship prayers that we do give our life away to Christ. And we declare him Lord of all. And we begin our growth of, in, in submission to him. 
But this is a process that goes on and on and on in our life. It actually is going on prior to us really committing to the Lordship of Christ. And it continues after we've committed to the Lordship of Christ. As we grow, Paul says in the old King James Version, from glory to glory to glory to glory. This is an incredible process. Now, here when it talks about this, it talks about the cost. All right, so he continues in verse 28. He says, but don't begin until you count the cost. Now, let me just give you a tip on this cost. To follow Christ, it will eventually cost you everything because you prioritize Christ and Christ alone. So that means some family members won't be as close to you anymore. Other family members in the family of God will become very close to you. And all those relationships will reprioritize. Now, here's the big point, though. When you give your life to Christ and when you become his disciple, you receive all kinds of benefits. You receive your eternal life. You receive a transformed na nature. You receive, a re you receive a, the ongoing process of renewing your mind. You receive all kinds of wonderful things. There's only one thing more expensive than giving your life to Christ. And that's not giving your life to Christ. If you don't give your life to Christ, you have to pay for your own sins. If you don't give your life to Christ, you'll be guessing about what you ought to do with your life. If you don't give your life to Christ, then there's all kinds of consequences that you pay because you don't have your creator, the one who made you, guiding and directing and leading you. Our purpose is primarily known by the one who created us. Lawn mowers are known best by the people who designed them. A home is known best by the architect that designed it or the builder that built it. Christ and Christ alone is our architect, is our builder, is our designer. So nobody knows how you can have a rich, prosperous, overcoming life that will cost you everything. Nobody knows that like God does. God knows why you were sent to the earth. God knows what your purpose and plan is supposed to be. God knows what your skills are. God knows what your weaknesses are. God loves you in the midst of all of that. He is absolutely sold on you. And so here when it says, for who would begin construction of a building without first calculating the cost to see if there's enough money to finish it? Otherwise, you might complete only the foundation before running out of money. And, and, and then everyone will laugh at you. They would say, there's the person who started that building but couldn't afford to finish it. In other words, you got into things that you didn't understand. Or what king would go to war against another king without first sitting down with his counselors to discuss whether an army of 10,000 can, uh, can defeat the 20,000 soldiers marching against him. And if he can't, he will send a delegation to discuss terms of peace while the enemy is still far away. So you cannot become my disciple without giving up everything you own. So how can you tell what you value? What's the measurement system? There are two measurement systems for you to know yourself. Number one, what do you do with your time? Your time, if you'll just chart your time or make some notes or think through what you do with your time, that, is, that reveals your priorities. Number two, what you do with your money. Because your money is reflective of your talents, your skills, your investments, all that kind of thing. So you can look at what you do with your money and what you do with your time and see what kind of a person you are. All right. Same with the church. I hear churches all the time that say, oh, we're devoted to prayer ministry. We love prayer ministry. And prayer doesn't have one item on their, on their budget. They don't invest in prayer. So do they believe in prayer? Well, they probably do with lip service. But you got to invest in what you believe in. We believe in missions. We invest in missionaries. We believe, in, we believe Christ and Christ alone is the way we can be guaranteed eternal life. So we invest in that message. We invest our time and our money in that message because it's in our core. And then he, he concludes this series of thoughts by saying, 
Salt is good for seasoning, but if it loses its flavor, how can you make it salty again? And the answer is you cannot. You've got to remain salty. All right, so here it says flavorless salt is good neither for the soil. In other words, it doesn't fertilize anything. It doesn't add nutrition to anything, nor for the manure pile. In other words, the, the, the important thing about a manure pile in this day is that it was alive with organisms and would become great fertilizer. Salt kills that. And so, so here it says it's thrown away. So in other words, salt that loses its flavor is just thrown away. Anyone with ears to hear should listen and understand. Okay, so how do we stay salty? Well, one, one idea would be come to our Bible study every weekday morning at 10 a.m. Mountain Time here on Zoom. You can come to the Bible study. You learn the scriptures. Number two, stay in fellowship. So learn the Bible, stay in fellowship. So go to a local church. Do not let this live stream broadcast or any TV broadcast or any of that replace face-to-face -face fellowship with people in your community. Real life, in-person contact is vitally important. All right, so you need to know the Bible. You need to uh, ha have people in your life that are also believers, believers meetings, that's what churches are, or, or good churches are. And then the third thing is learn to talk to God and hear his voice. So let his voice speak into you. Your voice should be speaking to him. And as the two of you become friends, uh, your life will change dramatically. Well, some big ideas here. I hope it's helpful for you. It's been great talking with you today. You have a wonderful Sunday. God bless you.